Please be seated. What we heard today in the gospel reading, that Jesus told the disciples, receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And today at this Pentecost gathering, well, the Holy Spirit takes center stage for us. Later in this service, we'll name and give thanks for the, the many gifts of the Holy Spirit. And so too, we will embody the Spirit's gift of diversity, languages and cultures and people during our prayers and our responses. Some celebrate today, this Pentecost Sunday, as the beginning of the church. However, Looking closely at today's Acts reading, I might argue a different interpretation of today. You see, Peter explained that the various languages spoken by the apostles were the results of the Holy Spirit. Now, his argument that he was making was based on the prophet Joel. Now, Joel is what we call one of the, the minor prophets or one of the, the shorter prophet books in the Hebrew scriptures. It was likely written about 400 to 500 years before today's reading. So, a good amount of time, right? What, that's, what, older than the United States of America is when Joel was writing before today's story. And Joel... Well, Joel, as a prophet, was writing about an ecological disaster caused by locusts and the threat of complete destruction by outside armies. And Joel, Joel went on to make a theological argument. Joel explained that amid the destruction and the threats in the world, that God is neither absent nor indifferent to the world's problems. God cares about God's people. And God cares about the earth that God lovingly created. Joel reminds us that God hears the cry of God's people and that God then responds in mercy. Now, I am fortunate enough that I don't have any fears of locusts or war being brought about the immediate destruction of my life, at least not anytime soon. And so if you're like me, you know, I, I might imagine that, that we often feel that God has left us alone in different ways. In fact, it's probably the topic that I hear most often from people. They'll catch me off guard and they'll say, I've got one question for you, Pastor. So why do bad things happen to good people? And usually they want a 15-second answer to this question that has stumped people of faith for thousands of years before they go on to check out at the clerk, with the checkout clerk at the grocery store or go on to drinking their beer at a bar. So I get it. It's a topic that people are curious about. It's the wondering it's the thought that God might have maybe inflicted kind of suffering or misfortune upon them because of some past action they did or that their, their family did. And, I'm, and I get it. I get that concern. After all, life so often throws us curveballs that upend our understanding of the world. And in those moments, we want to know why. It's like when a pregnancy goes oh so wrong and we want to find an explanation. Or when we look for answers after facing an unexpected diagnosis or death of a loved one. Or when we strive to get to the root cause of destruction and disaster. And especially in those moments when we can't seem to logically determine the cause, it becomes so easy to blame God. Blame that thing out there that we, we can't explain either. And then, 
And then, without honestly looking at the scriptures, we so easily succumb to the popular belief that the Old Testament God is somehow out to get us and destroy us and smite us. But what we discover in today's reading, what we discover in the book of Joel, is that God is not one of destruction. You see, the Old Testament God is not an angry God, and that God of the Hebrew Scriptures is not watching in some distance laughing at us. But rather, Joel, like many other authors in the Hebrew Scriptures, made it ever so clear that God acts, that God is a merciful God, and that God will liberate and rescue humanity from destruction. So you have to remember all of that as the setup four to five hundred years before today's reading in Acts. If we forget that context piece, we miss what's happening in Acts. Because then today we heard that Peter is keeping that in mind when he speaks about the gifts of the Holy Spirit. You see, Peter is preaching that the Holy Spirit has animated the disciples. And he's refer referring back to the prophet Joel as he preaches that God is present and loving. You see, a God who, who uh, Peter quoted from Joel, well, well, that God has poured out the Spirit on all flesh. Poured, out, poured it out on men and women. And remember, women, women are property. But yet, the Spirit of God was poured out on men and women. And the Spirit of God was poured out on those who were free and those who were slaves. Again, those who were property. God poured out the Spirit. And then God goes on to talk about the young and the old. The young were useless. Useless. Sometimes we still think that today. But they were really seen as useless until they become, became the age of maturity and could give something. And so you see our God, what Joel was saying four to five hundred years before what happened in Acts, and what our God was saying over 2,500 years ago was a big deal. God was saying those people that you think are absolutely useless, it is those people that God has poured the Spirit upon, that God has revealed, that God is indwelling with within them. You see, Joel is making abundantly clear that all of creation, even the useless things that we can think about, all of creation is included in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And so when Jesus breathed the Spirit onto the disciples in today's gospel, so too, we don't just think about acts or you know, the stylized dove that we have over the baptism font that reminds us of the Holy Spirit's presence. But rather, so too we remember the Spirit of God that hovered over the waters of creation. That that same Spirit present in the creation narrative is the same Spirit that animated Jesus Christ. And it is the same Spirit given to the disciples. And it's the same Spirit that is given to you, to me, in our baptisms. You see, the Spirit poured out on the disciples, well, it was not the new beginning of a church. It was not a new beginning of the ways that God acts in the world. You see, the animating Spirit of God, that has been present since the very beginning. The very beginning. And so I wonder, you know, once we come to really understand, when we begin to realize that this animating spirit that God has put into all things, well, when we realize that you have that animating spirit and that I have that animating spirit and that our most hated enemy and that person in the meeting who seems to bring up the most useless things over and over again, that they too 
are animated by God's Spirit? Well, that, that brings about something radically different in us. You see, for if we are all of one spirit, then, then we are on the same team. We are of one mind. We are all one in the spirit. And so the diversity in the ways that people think and act and process things and live, well, all of these things, they are all expressions of God's spirit. So then, then if we take seriously what is black and white in front of us about how God works and how God is in all people and all of creations, then, then we have this opportunity to enact a sense of unity. So as refugees and asylum seekers come to our door, we are reminded that they are one with us in God's spirit. They embody God's spirit. When our LGBTQIA+, and our BIPOC, and our AAPI siblings hurt, and they call out to be seen and to be heard, well, we recall that they are one with God's Spirit. When wetlands, and highlands, and lowlands are destroyed for profit and wealth, well, we, we are called to pause and acknowledge that the creating spirit of God is in every creature, in every living thing. And you see, with that mindset, when we become to realize what already is, even if we don't recognize it, what already is, is that God's spirit is in all people and all of creation. Now, if we choose to recognize it or not, that's an entirely different thing. But once we begin to recognize it, even in just one person or in one place, well, you see, that is the life-shattering, life-changing, life-shifting power of Pentecost. It is how the gifts of the Spirit, well, 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 they cause us to pause, pause and acknowledge the Spirit working in mysterious and uncomfortable ways. You see, the Spirit of God has protected, supported, and liberated generations. Yes, back to the apostles and acts, but so too back to the time of Joel and back to the very beginning. And so in the midst of that, knowing that the Spirit of God has been with us and will be with us, well then, then in the times of uncertainty of climate change or the movement of migrants across the world or just the changing world that we seem to live in, well you see, we can recall that God has said the diversity in our world is not only good, but it is a gift of God's spirit. And that the diversity in the world, well, it reflects God's fullness. And so, so then, instead of trying to be a monolithic culture, instead of locking others out, instead of banning books, well, we can name that our God has another path. It is a path that brings about life. It is a path rooted in the animation of God's spirit. It is a path filled with diversity of all of God's goodness. It is a path where we begin to appreciate the diversity that our God has given us. And because it is a holiday weekend, I'm going to go ahead and leave it there. And I could go on and on and on, but you see how I didn't put a little story in there just to drag it out? I'm not one of those preachers. You probably already know that by now. But the story is the Pentecost story. And that's the story that only matters. After all, just in that story, we have so much to chew on. We've seen how the God of the Hebrew Scriptures is, is one who is ever-present and merciful and loving. We are reminded that Christ gave us the same Spirit of God, given you the same Spirit, a Spirit that enlivens all of creation without exception. And it is because of that radical gift of love that gift of mercy, that gift of acceptance, already given by our God if we choose to recognize it or not, it is because of all of that that then we have the opportunity to reflect that same spirit in how we welcome and love and engage others. For what we know 
from the very beginning and yet again on this Pentecost Sunday is that our God looks at the diversity of humanity and indeed of all of creation and said, this is good. And so on this final day of the Easter season, we are reminded of the abundant life that is found in diversity of gifts and languages and peoples because it is rooted in God's merciful, loving, and gracious spirit. And so my prayer for you as we wrap up this Easter season is that you might come to recognize this gift each day in unexpected places and people, in the ones that frustrate us and the ones that bring us joy, that you can see God's spirit and recognize the fullness of God all among us. For in that, that is the abundant life. That is the eternal life. That is the risen Christ. Alleluia and amen.